Uh, so first of all, uh, welcome everyone. Thanks around for sticking around. And we're gonna change pace a little bit. And I know that throughout the whole morning, you guys heard a lot of just interesting lectures related to pharmacology, drug mechanism, disease, everything. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about possibly the future, what is up around the corner, and that is application of artificial intelligence in the diagnosis of skin cancer mainly. Uh, I don't have any conflict to disclose. I'm gonna cover majorly four topics. Uh, one is give you an idea of the current state, uh, what we do right now for skin cancer detection, and second, I'll give you a brief history about progression of AI. And the last two point is talking about the application of AI and and give you really sort of think about the collaboration versus competitive nature, uh, we as a species versus the machine. So um, this is a four melanomas that I picked up. Um, they're relatively small, you know, they're less than six millimeters, they're indistinct, and uh, they don't have the ABCD features. And if you put dermoscopy on it, and which I'm gonna give a lecture tomorrow morning as a workshop, um, it is really, really difficult, all right? And uh, now, how do we go about this, right? And uh, first of all, we do whole body skin check, all right? And uh, if you, the idea is very simple. If you don't look, you're not gonna find it. Uh, you go through in a systematic fashion. And next, demoscopy in the hands of experienced user, you can raise the diagnostic accuracy by about 20%, but you have to sort of train to do this. As a beginner, most of studies have shown that your diagnostic accuracy actually drop before it gets better, right? Um, now, last, uh, you can do something called a total body photography. Those is not reserved for all the patients, but in essence, those for people who have, let's say, more than 75 nevi, and you need some sort of baseline to track them, and so you can look for progressions, all right? And uh, one of the most important thing is change. In the ABCDs, E is evolution change. Change is the most important thing in my mind at this point, especially picking up really early melanomas. Now, we also have some really cool technology like confocal laser microscopy, and uh, the idea here it is, you know, you have a device such as this, and you have a handheld device, and the resolution is very, very small, and it gives you images on the right uh, that it's on comparable scale, comparable resolution as a h and &E histology, all right? And you can pick up a melanoma. I think this technology is really, really helpful for lenticle melanomas on the face. Now, here are the drawbacks with all those approaches we got, right? Uh, first of all, demoscopy, as I mentioned before, it takes time, expertise, and training. And total body photography, 3D photography, cost infrastructure, and not to mention cybersecurity. And if you know, if someone breaking into your EMR, that's one thing, but they're hacking to your total body photography, now you got a big problem. They got a whole bunch of naked pictures roaming around on the website. Um, confocal laser microscopy is also more training and everything else. And clinical exam, all of us took years to get to this where we are. It takes about 10, 15 years to train all of our brains to recognize skin cancer. So in addition, and there are also other forces at play, uh, we as a field uh, have a shortage of dermatologists, and especially let's say if you're looking for a patient who tried to call in for any concerning lesion, it takes about four to six weeks uh, to just get in to see a dermatologist, get in to see an MP, PAs in certain parts of the country. Um, patient's expectation, in the world of Amazon Prime, you put something in your phone, the next day the thing shows up in your front door, and Patient wants something to have the same kind of expectation. And also the cost, shift in healthcare cost, all right? So all those are at play. Now, this is a quote from Einstein, that is, we cannot solve the problem with the same thinking we used when we created them, all right? This is where AI sort of come in, all right? Now, give you a background about progression of AI. This whole process sort of started about in the 1950s, and they have classical and, and system that pro people programmed them in. In 1985 to 2005, there was sort of a evolution change and showing some of the promise, but nothing really took place until now, all right? And the reason for it is traditional AI approach, in essence, you know, if you want a AI specifically to recognize images, and people program everything in, all right? So let's say on the right, on the left, you see this cat, it has specific shape, 
And the programmers basically type in that something has a round face, two pointed triangle that may be an ear, and two eyes, and a long tail, rectangular body, and that's a cat, right? So at time, it's pretty good in recognizing regular cat, but it's gonna fail to recognize cat in this kind of weird geonomic, geo-like positions. So what the deep learning, the next, this phase that's taking place in every aspect of a life, right? What they do is, Basically, they just feed all those images and data into this deep learning neural network and let the machine somehow figure out what is a cat versus an elephant or something else, right? So this is a very, very simplistic way of thinking about this. Now, in the life of outside of life, and there was a, in 2007, and this is kind of a project that took place, uh, essentially, they basically pulled a data set about 15 million labeled images uh, belong to almost 22,000 categories and, um, and let the machine sort of ran it. And the deep neural network of those 3D machines are able to categorize a whole bunch of different things, right? And we see that in our life right now. So for those of you who has an iPhone and uh, you basically take lots and lots of pictures and what you can do is Apple software somehow can figure out who that person is, right? Your loved ones, your spouse, your kids. And in addition, as a child age, and the software can still recognize them without you having to put the information in. And this, this works, but not all the time, right? So in real life, you see that already happening. So I'm gonna talk to you about, in order to for make this happen, you need about three transition of technology. One, since 2012, you have enormous amount of increasing power in the computational power and storage, access, cloud, all those information. And the evolution network has got a lot better and better and better, all right? And the biggest limiting step is data set. And in essence, as long as you have a huge data set, and you can have programmers basically sit in the garage somewhere and develop algorithm and train the data set to get better and better and better, right? So now you have an understanding about some really basic information. I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about how AI is being used and what is around the corner and what is implication for all of us. So I started this journey about almost in 1999, when I was a melanoma fellow working for this guy, uh, Al Kaf at NYU. For those who do not know, he was a giant in the field of melanoma in demoscopy. And he was the one who actually brought demoscopy from Europe to America. And he worked with this guy, Merrick Albaum, who was a astrophysicist. And what they did was, it was really interesting, this company he started, during, it was funded during the Cold War. The, the idea was to try to recognize incoming missile from Russia versus a, some sort of a, a, a meteor. And uh, when the Cold War somehow ended and there was funding ran out, and what they did was they tried to figure out using the same technology to try to recognize skin cancer. And what they did was came up with a device like this, it's called a Melafine, and uh, it's a handheld device, and essentially took nine monographic image and was different wavelength. And this concept is you're basically taking images so it allows the photons to section horizontally different levels of the image and it created nine such image and then feed it into an algorithm and the algorithm was basically trying to figure out what the machine is. And what happened to this company was it eventually actually went and cleared the FDA. The FDA gave it a, some sort of a device, allow it to go forward and went onto the market. But the problem was the sensitivity of the machine during the trial was set so high, but the idea is you don't want to miss a melanoma in the field. But when you actually took this machine into real life practice, and you could not really differentiate a lot of like separate keratosis, atypical nevis, because the threshold was set so high. And for a variety of reasons, this effort, this company went under. Now, uh, during that time, in around the early 2000s, this was not the only company that's working in that technology. Uh, in essence, this is a series of paper that was published over that period of time in documenting the application of this kind of technology that took place in Australia, in Europe, and all of a sudden, everything just sort of died away. And 
for, for the reason I'm going to try to explain later. Now, the reason they failed all this stuff is one, lack of data set. Two, the algorithm is not there. Three, and the machine perhaps is not fast enough. So fast forward to 2017, and this is what happened. There's a couple of papers that came out in Nature, there was a Stanford group that showed that they were able to design algorithm to detect skin cancer, and this generated a lot of publicities, and uh, basically people arguing that is dermatologist still needed, or is AI is gonna be even better than dermatologist? So the effort, the behind the scene that led to those publication was a uh, initiative called the ISIC initiative. So pr I joined Hogue, uh, the hospital in uh, Orange County about three, three weeks ago actually. Prior to that, I spent 16 years at Sloan Kettering. Uh, we at Sloan Kettering New York were basically led this effort and basically brought all the images to a centralized database and then teamed up with the various um, uh, like companies, tech companies like IBM Watson to basically trying to figure out and open this platform to the world in essence. So this is one of the culmination study that came out in Lancet in 2019. And what they did was it had about uh, 511 human subjects. That is 511 folks with different experience level in looking at dermoscopy images of skin lesions, all right? And they, those 511 dermatologists came out of 63 countries and, um, and, and then there were about 139 algorithm that was submitted from the world and um, um, from 77 different machine labs, okay? So the idea is we want to see how good are those algorithm in compared to 500 demoscopists, dermatologists, all right? And with different experience level. So let me show you the data. So this is the first set, all right? It's kind of a busy slide. It's actually very easy. So it divided into uh, four different sets and um, so this is mean balance set, meaning that half the lesion is benign, half the lesion is malignant. Uh, this data set means is more benign, meaning all this data set in there show a lot more of benign lesions, and you got more malignant data set and random, just thrown in there, all right? And the way to look at this graph is, so you got four data set, and think of this line, basically, all right? If anything, falls below, to the left of this line, that means humans are actually doing better than the algorithm, right? So you got all this algorithm right here, four data sets. So this entire set, it basically showed that those algorithm performed worse than human subjects, all right? Now, next, there's a lot more algorithm, right? And they're on par. Okay, so they're right on the middle line. So those algorithm actually was better, about the same compared to the 511 uh, human subjects. Next, now you start seeing trend where algorithm is better than the human beings, all right, the demoscopist. So there were actually three or four that really sort of stood out and they were way better than the human subjects, all right? So what this study demonstrated is the following. Uh, that is one, the technology is already there in essence, okay? The technology is showing the feasibility of machine beating human beings, beating the best. And they're not only beating the beginners, the intermediary, and they're actually beating some of the world experts in demoscopist, okay? And so some of those algorithm is being actually deployed in, the, um, uh, in, in some of the programs. And so this is one of them. You, you, you can't really basically, for legal reason, you can't really say this is a, uh, a diagnostic tool because you have to go through the FDA clearance. But it will show you a score and if it's benign, you will show up as like kind of a green and with a low score, but if it's malignant, you will show up as something as red, as in this example. For instance, 
everything here. This top lesion has a low score, and uh, the bottom score has a red, so that's malignant lesion. And on top of which, you will show you images in their own database that almost look, feel exactly like the one that you see. All right. So here's a uh, very interesting progression, right? So on the right, this is one of my colleagues from Mayo Clinic. He was one of the world experts. And uh, he didn't do the study, I don't believe, but he is considered one of the world experts. And on the left, you have folks who are dermatologists and PPA, primary care physicians. And prior to the introduction of those technology, you want to know which person would you want to go see. It's almost like no-brainer, right? And you want to go see this guy because he's a man who's going to be able to find the melanoma for you, find the skin cancer for you, and without doing a necessary biopsy, the goal is uh, uh, ba basically improve the benign to malignant ratio of the biopsies. But you can imagine the day comes not too far in the distant future where the folks on the left can do the examination and take a special scope powered by the algorithm, put it on the device, put it on the patients, and the device is going to give you a score. Right? And it's going to tell you whether it's benign or malignant. And it's actually going to be better than the guy right there. So it's almost like a game changer, right? So now, um, move on. But it's not as simple as this right now, OK? The reason for it, the study that was done, essentially, you already picked out one lesion. And the machine is only looking at that one lesion. But in reality, what's happening here is when you look at a patient, and this is what you see, right? The guy's got cover with lots of moles. You still need that trained eyes to basically figure out which lesions you're going to look. And that step is currently the gap at this point, right? So you will think, well, the expert still has an advantage. Okay, now I'm going to show you another technology. Well, before that. So machine also has certain issues. So this is one of the image lesion that was shown to the machine, all right? And the machine looked at it, and uh, it says, OK, this is a benign lesion, and this is a malignant lesion, and the machine somehow thinks this is a vascular lesion, all right? But in reality, we just show them a point of a banana, basically. So this is the kind of example, the kind of exaggerated example of what we talked about before, right? You still have to basically putting everything into the right context and figure out what to look, okay? So I'm going to show you another technology. So now this is one of the technology called the Vectra 360. And uh, what it has is about 46 cameras attached to the entire spot. And it's almost like you're going through the TSA checkout, going through the airline, right? And you basically stand there with your hands down. And uh, in less than three milliseconds, 46 cameras fire simultaneously and basically captures your whole bodies, all right? And then it creates a 3D avatar of your body, OK? So now, the advantage of having such device is that you can program the classifiers, all right? The classifiers, depending on the size, lesion, and you can, you can basically change this algorithm right here. And the machine it does is basically sorts out all those lesions according to your parameter that you set and basically create a histograms of this lesion. So you can pick the biggest, the darkest in the center, and you sort of circulate out as to all these more benign lesions. And you can basically tap one of those lesions, and you will go onto the body map and show you exactly where it is, right? So, and, and you can basically customize set filters and show you what's called ugly duckling type of lesions, right? And then there's something else what you can do. That is, because the images are taken in the 3D fashion, it will allow you to put that patient back into the machine 
a year, two years later to take another set of pictures, all right? Now, because it's taken 3D and you can match exactly the lesion, the location, and you can track the change in size, all right? So this is where some of the technology is coming. And so this is an example coming from Sydney, Australia, where they use this technology and put people through it. And this is image taken over the course of two years. And as you can see, the machine somehow picked up the clinical change right here and diagnosed this as a early melanoma in situ and trained and prompted the physician basically to pay attention to that lesion and look, and they biopsy that showed the melanoma in situ, right? Now, uh, so here's more example. So this is where we are at this point, right? And um, so naturally you'll be thinking, uh, holy crap, you know, what is my job? <laughs> so, I mean, as someone, um, I've been, you know, doing this for almost 20 years as a dermatologist, right? And, um, and, and I prided myself for all these years of training to get really, really good in dermoscopy and everything else. And I'm heavily involved with those intelligence, AI, development, and everything else. One part of me thinking, thank God I'm a mo surgeon. You know, that's my other half a job. I still have a job. The, the AI is not going to be able to take away my job in cutting and, and taking layers, right? Uh, but, you know, you, you, you think to yourself, uh, we can be replaced, right? But in, in one dimension that it is great because you can improve access for on the societal level and you can pick up skin cancer much earlier and you can expand the workforce of dermatologists. Right, to detect people earlier. But on the individual level, and you feel, naturally speaking, our job is maybe threatened, basically. And you see that already in other field. And the last time I actually went into the, a Newark airport flying out somewhere, I remember three, four years ago, they remodeled the entire airport. And in every single restaurant, there's no waiters or waitresses. There's a flat panels sitting in front of you. You just click on it and you make orders and people deliver the food. And you see this kind of automation and being transitioned in every aspect of our life, right? And in the world of outsource, automation, and uh, you wonder what is the value of human? So it becomes a very philosophical at this point, right? Now, you're thinking about competition, but I urge you not to think like that because that may be the wrong question to ask. The reason for it is very simple. This is already happening. Whether we like it or we don't like it, this is happening. You might as well accept it, right? And figure out what can we do as human beings, as healthcare providers to provide added values. Think about this model. How do we collaborate? What do we can do? What is our added value? I'm going to give you some tips and pointers from what I think. So this is actually a study that came out about two years ago. And this is coming from Europe. Um, and they sort of looked at the human-computer collaboration for skin cancer detection. Now, what everyone is trying to figure out at this point, what can we do? So a couple of key take points message. One is... <coughs> When somehow you're encountering with a suspicious lesion, right, the clinicians uh, somehow with the AI assistance, they will switch from the both the biopsy to monitoring with AI support. That's one interesting finding, right? So a lot of times I think, you know, we go out to daily practice and uh, the, the, the incentive is completely misaligned in a sense. That is. If you see something that's worrisome and concerning, you biopsy it, you get paid for it. And God forbid, if you're wrong, it's okay, you biopsied it. But if you monitor this lesion, what happened? You're wrong, you get sued, right? So you don't get paid, you get sued. So, so that's, that's the real life right now, right? But with AI support, and you can hopefully tip that balance a little bit. And the second application that everyone's tried to figure out is, how do you incorporate AI in telemedicine? 
And we saw that during COVID, a lot of us took telemedicine. And derm dermatology is actually a really, really ripening field because we are image-based. And perhaps, you know, individual can take the pictures and uh, store for to send it to a provider, and the provider looked at it and give a diagnosis what to do. But you can imagine in the day where the first triage pass is done by machine because machine is gonna be as good as human being, right? So that's one application. And uh, third is AI algorithm actually showed better accuracy in picking up pigmented AK than human beings because we think somehow the machine is not only looking at the solitary lesions, it's looking at the entire image on the side, all right? And the way, it's almost like a little bit like a black box. We don't actually understand what those parameters, what those machines are really looking at. And the clues the machine have and escape the human eyes, escape the way we look at, as a human being looking at the lesions. So here's something else. Um, if the, the, the provider is someone who's experienced and they're very confident that the algorithm actually provide a very low value to those providers. But it's really helpful this for people who are less experienced and they actually really, really help, okay? And <clears throat> now all raters, regardless of experience, are susceptible to underperforming when given a faulty AI-based algorithm. That makes sense, right? Because we are all influenced. When we're looking at this lesion, if the machine is telling us something, the machine is something like error in the programming, and we will be biased by the machine. We will second guess ourselves. So what those machines, what those algorithms, what those black box things makes a huge difference. Now I'm gonna end the talk by telling you three stories, two stories and, and one uh, sort of a roadmap in thinking where is our value, okay? <clears throat> the first is a story about Air France and coming flew out of Rio de Janeiro, I think in 2019 and went from Rio de Janeiro all the way to Paris. It was a tragedy, this was a tragedy. What happened was in the around two o'clock, uh, probably across the Atlantic Ocean, they encountered some storm, they knocked out the sensors, and all of a sudden at that point, they don't have speed sensors. Now, at two o'clock in the morning, and there were two pilots sitting in the cockpit, and the one who was running this was the one that's a little bit considered inexperienced. And they switched down this off, they switched off all the pilot, and the guy was flying. And he didn't understand what is going on. And in less than five minutes later, the plane crashed, the entire crew, passenger, they all perished, right? When they digged up, when they did all this, they, they realized <clears throat> there was a human error. And I, I can understand that because I think we're living in the world where technology is so far advanced and for instance, I just joined my new hospital, I had to learn Epic. And I can see a patient in less than five minutes, but it took me like two, three days to learn Epic. It's like a complete bane of my existence right now, right? Epic. And um, even though it's so easy, but just like all this button you have to push, and even though like, I saw the patient in less than three, four minutes, I couldn't finish what I have to do, right? So the idea here is technology is becoming so complex, and automation, we rely on it so much, when the automation breaks down, when the technology breaks down, when your iPhone stop working, you'll be like, holy crap, what am I gonna do with my life, right? And you can't do half the things. So we rely on technology so much, and that is one of the pitfalls, I think. Second, I think this is a much more well-known story, and uh, this actually happened um, <clears throat> also in 2019. It was January, February, something really cold in New York. And this captain uh, flying the U.S. Airway, Sonnenberger, and took off from LaGuardia. And less than 46 minutes later, a bird hit one of the engines, knocked out one of the engines. And uh, a couple, of, like a minute, less than a minute later, another bird took out the, other, the second engine. So basically, he's flying there without no power and hovering around Manhattan skyline, right? He called in the radio tower and basically says, listen, this is what's happening. And the, what they told him is like, one, turn around, come back. Two, is landing New Jersey. So in the face of this 
the guy made a crazy decision. It's such a brave decision. What he did was he basically go land right into the Hudson River, okay? And I was actually living on the Hudson River. I knew what it was like. I can see it, right? And, and I think, miraculously, everyone on board survived, right? So he was cheered as a hero, but what you didn't really know was the aftermath, what happened to this guy. He got grilled, basically. And, and, but in order for someone who take that kind of gut, because you know, he's taking orders from the towers for everything. If you follow the protocol, okay, this is what you're supposed to do. But he took a, a path that's far more riskier. And he saved everyone. It, to me, I think this is what we will be facing down the road. Medicine is becoming a much more algorithmic evidence, quote unquote, evidence-based, right? You are supposed to do X, Y, Z. You are supposed to follow the protocol. In a way, this is supposed to achieve better standard of care, saving money, deliver better quality of care. But the patient in front of you is a unique individual. The case is different. What the machine is going to tell you down the road may not be the right thing. You have to have the courage. That's what I call you can't be a wuss. You have to have the courage to deviate away from that and make the right call. Third, I think this is where we as a human being really have to excel. We cannot be the machine on a one-to-one -one simplistic repetitive task. The machine will beat us every single time. What we can still excel is be human. That means be more compassionate, be more empathetic, don't be a robot. But this is really hard to do because what do we do nowadays? We're tied in front of EMR. The guy is talking to us. You know, I go see my doctor. He's turning around and typing, right? And so we need to change the workflow. We need to basically look at the patient and I, talk to them, touch them. And those kind of simple things, that is where we add the value. And we have to basically let the machine take away the remedial task and allow us to have better interactions with the patient. Uh, with that, I thank you.